Hi. <laughs> you guys doing all right? Did anybody get plastered this morning? <laughs> I didn't know if I was all by myself. Or <laughs> um, man, you are enough for me. Is that an actual song? Or did you just flow with that? Now it is. <laughs> Yeah, that's got to be, uh, that's got to get out there because that's, that's the message, you know. So, um, I just got to say, first of all, how many of you are members of the church here? Let me see your hands. I really can't see you, but I'm going to try. Okay. Um, Brittany and Caesar, Andrew and Crystal, they are exactly what they named their church. They are home. What do you mean? When I hear him up here speaking the way he does, that's home. When I see them valuing the person and presence of Jesus above everything else, that is home. <laughs> and I feel like a stranger in places where that is not the case. But here I feel home because I feel as if they are home. So I just want to honor them and say thank you so much for for inviting us out. To be here is a, is a high honor for me, and my wife. And, and I also just wanna say one of my dearest friends in the world is here, you guys know already, Michael Dow is here. Yeah, I love him with all my heart. He's, he's really rare. Uh, I, 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 I met him many years ago, but I, I got to get closer to him in the midst of a bunch of people. And um, he stood out head and shoulders above the rest. It was just clear the Lord was on his life in a special way. So you're going to hear from him tonight, and uh, you will not be the same. <laughs> so I'm ready to speak. Are you guys ready to listen? Did you have a pen and paper? No? Anybody brought a Bible? <laughs> I am so excited to tell you what the Lord has been telling to me. Listen, if we give ourselves to his presence, he gives to us his words. So I wish to speak to you about Jesus, <laughs> and Jesus only. I wish to speak to you specifically about his irresistible beauty. I wish to speak to you about the all-sufficiency of his person. You are enough for me, In you is all I need. See, both of these statements, the irresistible beauty and the all-sufficiency of his person can be summed up in one word. And I want you to say this word with me, okay? Say bridegroom. That word bridegroom, this idea bridegroom, this understanding of bridegroom is the merge of his irresistible beauty and the all-sufficiency of his person. The reason why I feel this is very significant is because I believe we are in constant need of a vision of him that draws us out of ourselves. I know in my own life, if I don't see him, I become very self-focused, very self-centered, very self-esteem oriented. But when I see him, I forget me. And I find that all of my problems have one main root. And you, know, you want to know what that root is? Me. <laughs> I find that when I listen to people during like counseling moments, when somebody confides in me, if you really go down to what's really troubling the person, it's themselves. They're thinking so much about everything that has to do with them. But when we see him, we lose sight of us. And I find that here is the highest freedom. It's, it's the most important disposition. It's the key to everything that he wants for us is for us to forget us and be completely captivated by his person, the precious, spotless bridegroom. So the kind of sight that I'm talking about is that sight that, that makes you say, a hymn, a tone, a song when I see you, for you are the, the dream's fulfillment that I've ever knew. See, inside of him, emeralds turn to dust. 
Is that not true? Emeralds turn to dust. Rubies turn to toys. Mansions are morbid rust and pride is worthless noise. It's just the value of the shining one placed next to whatever you've got in front of you. You'll find that whatever you place next to the shining one becomes as insignificant as dust. You find that as his bright shining splendor is beheld in your life, you become blinded to the other things, even as I cannot see you right now because of the brightness of the light shining on my face. I'm by faith believing that you're there. <laughs> see, there's many figures in the scripture. If you, how many of you have ever read through the Bible in its totality? Okay, how many of you have just read a whole bunch of the Bible? You're not sure if you read everything. You'll find that there are so many figures that God uses to teach us little things. And, and some people would call it a parable. Parabal means, parabole means one thing cast alongside another to help you understand something. And so there's lots of these kinds of figures in the scripture. If you went down the list, you could see wine as the spirit. Or you could see bread of life. You could see light of life. You see all these different imageries. But I believe there is a climax of them all. I believe there's one paramount to all the others, and it is this Christ bridegroom. I believe it's the greatest imagery that shows to you and me his intended and desired relationship with every one of our hearts. And you don't have to be a female to have a bridegroom. You find that he turns everyone into a giddy little girl if he comes close. <laughs> Uh, he's wonderful. See, in Revelation twenty two seventeen, 17, turn there real quick. I want to show you something. I'll, take, I'll give you a minute to get there. Because <clears throat> you got to look at it. It's very important. And this is the premise of the entire message that I believe the Lord has given to me for this time together. Okay. Are you there? The Bible says, now look at how close we are to the end. To the right, you should probably see concordance, promises of the Bible, perspectives, ministry. Te you should see all kinds of other stuff over on the side because you're at the end of the Bible here. This is the end of the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the end of all things, the consummation. This is where it's all headed, where it's all going to end. Are you ready? The spirit and the bride say, come. I want to stop right there. Do you see the come is spoken by two specific things, the spirit and the bride. So the culmination, the culmination of all things is a bride saying, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord. Come, Lord, come. Come. You, so you see a bride in the end, and you see in Genesis the picture of the second Adam inside of the first Adam where he has a bride taken out of himself and then presented back to himself. So you see everything starts with a love story, and it ends with a love story. So you see it's started with love, and it all culminates with love. The spirit and the bride say come. He's not, it doesn't say the spirit and the warriors say come. It doesn't say the spirit and the Olympians or the sages or the millionaires or the kings. It says the spirit and the bride. And there's a reason why. It's because this is what he wants everything to point you to. This is where he wants us as a church to end up. He returns for a bride. See, we see this whole bridal mentality of God's love for humanity all throughout the scriptures. I'll give you a couple of ex examples. Do you remember when Abraham wants a bride for his son? Do you remember this? Do you, do you remember what he did to find a bride to give to his son? He sent out his servant, his servant with all kinds of gold and precious stones and jewels, and he goes to uh, a city amongst his people, and he finds a girl named Rachel by the well. Do you remember this? 
And do you remember what he does when he finds her and he sees and knows by confirmation that it's her? He presents to her all these gifts that are pointing to the one he has come to represent. And he says, look it, here's all these wonderful gifts from someone who wants to marry you. And then he says, will you come with me? Will you go with this man? And she says, yes, I will go. I'm telling you, that is a beautiful imagery of God the Father sending out the Holy Ghost with many gifts that point to his Son. And he's asking even today, while he gives to you these wonderful, blessed treasures, but the treasures are not the things themselves. They're pointing to the one in whom they have their origin, the bridegroom himself. And he says, will you come and marry me? This is an imagery of the bridegroom. We see Ruth and Boaz. What does Boaz do? He lays everything that she needs in front of her. So she doesn't even have to go work and pick up everything. He does it all, bundles it all up, and he has it laid out for her. So all she has to do is come by and pick them up. This is how the, the love relationship with Jesus works. He does everything for you, and all you've got to do is just pick it up. Because he loves you. You see, in Psalm 45, David goes like this. My heart, my heart is overflowing. His heart of, of love is bursting up and out and over. And what is it bursting up and out and over for? He's thinking of a woman who leaves everything behind. She says, he says, forget your father and your people and turn to him, the bridegroom. And David writes this and he shows that this is what the king desires. This is what the king sees as beautiful. When you and I cut ourselves off from everything that we've ever known, all the provisions we can make ourselves, all the safety that we have in ourselves, all the logic that we have in ourselves, we cut it off and say, now you are my soul supplier. Now you are the one who satisfies my needs. Now you, and I look to you and you only, to be everything that I I need. This is what God sees as absolutely beautiful. We also see a, uh, the, uh, the beautiful love in Hosea. How many of you have read Hosea? What an incredible picture while other prophets are crying out things like this, injustice or repent or sin. Hosea's cry is very different. Hosea cries, you don't love me anymore. <laughs> and here is the heart, the heart cry of God, the great bridegroom in Christ, saying, I want you to love me. Isaiah uses the same language. He says, her maker is her husband. Jeremiah weeps, and he says, I remember when you loved me like a bride. Do you remember? So we see Ezekiel also provides a picture of God as a bridegroom covering the nakedness of a woman and then pulling her towards himself, cleaning her up and taking her to himself. And then we see it becomes the great announcement of John the Baptist when he arrives. He calls him the bridegroom. Isn't that beautiful? We see not only bridegroom out of the mouth of John the Baptist. Oh, it, this is very interesting, by the way. John the Baptist clears the way. Clears the way. What do you do when you clear the way? You get everything out from in front of the one you're clearing the way for. John the Baptist says, these things may be good, but they're not him. And he pushes them all away so that all you see is him. And this is what the last day's movement is. Let's take everything out of the way of the bridegroom so that only he shines in our faces. So we see Jesus as bridegroom out of the mouth of John the Baptist. He's clearing the way, removing every obstruction, anything, everything that gets in the way of him. If there's any doubt left in your mind that Jesus is bridegroom, it comes out of the mouth of Jesus himself. He calls himself the bridegroom. <laughs> when? When he says, they say, why don't your disciples fast? Then he says, why would they fast when the bridegroom is with them? Jesus calls himself the bridegroom. So now it's all settled, right? That Jesus actually is the perfect bridegroom. You know, an interesting note, Jesus' first miracle takes place at a wedding. 
Do you think that's coincidence? No, it's perfectly placed. Why? 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 What's the significance of it? You know, the funny thing, too, is that when his mother comes to him and she says, hey, will you help them? They ran out of wine. You remember what Jesus says? He says, woman, why are you bothering me with this? This ain't my wedding. What do you mean, Eric? How, how can, he didn't say that. He said, it's not my time. Right, but in Revelation, it says, now the time has come for the bride and the bridegroom to come together. Jesus is looking at a coming day when he will be married. And he's at a wedding, and she says, help them. And he goes, this ain't my wedding. But he helps her anyways. And what does he do? In this love atmosphere of commitment one to another where no one else is seen but two lovers who think that the entire world is a platform for their love. Right there in the midst of that, he changes water that is from the earth into wine that's from heaven. Here's the reason why so many people don't know the, the sweet intoxication of the presence of God. It's because the water of their life is not being turned to the heavenly wine by the love relationship there is in marrying Jesus. <laughs> oh, I want to marry you, Lord. Day in and day out, I want to marry him daily. And find the sweet enjoyment of his person. Here it is. You are all that I could ever want and all that I ever need. See, it's this bridal union that we see here. See, if we can, if we can, turn, uh, if we can turn our faces to Jesus, we'll find that he can turn any place and every situation into a garden of spices with our beloved. He just turn it all around and, and remove you out from underneath the influence of whatever you think it is that is so important. You find that his face just pales everything else. We see Paul also in Ephesians. He uses the wonderful unveiling. He, he unveils with these words. He says, what I speak to you about when I speak of a husband and a wife is what, is, is what I really mean is that it's Christ in the church. <laughs> He's trying to say that the the Lord is our husband and we are the wife. And then he uses language from Genesis. And he says this, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And the two are no longer two, but one. Do you see it? It's the loss of self in another. The two, one. The loss of self in another. <laughs> It's incredible. This is, what he, this is what he wants with us every single day is the loss of ourselves raptured in him, wrapped, R-A-P-T, wrapped in the splendor and majesty of who and what he is every single day. See, the height of all imagery that we're even talking about right now is reached in the book of Revelation, the crowning spectacle of God's love, the power of God, the crux of of all creation, the summit of redemption, the peak of grace, the wonder of the angels, and the bliss of God is seen in Revelation chapter 21, verse 9. He says, come with me, and I will show you the bride of the Lamb of God. What is it? It is this love relationship of the lamb and his bride. It is the peak of everything that God is doing in the earth. It's where it all ends. It's where it's all going. The spirit and the bride say, come. What makes her the bride? Well, number one, she recognizes him as her bridegroom. We cannot be a bride if we don't recognize him as a bridegroom. So a lot of people are like, yeah, well, I got it down. I got the warrior thing down. I got, the, I got this down. No, no, no. You're not a bride until you recognize his love. If there's no intimate love exchange with Jesus, you are not a bride. Love is so important because you can put, you can substitute many things in place of it. But whatever you do is, is lost without love. It's love. Love of Jesus that is everything. So no man can say that this subject that occupies such a predominant place in the word of God is insignificant. As a matter of fact, what this means should take up the whole setting of our hearts. Our lives must be wrapped in this wonderful view of him as this. So in, in the book of Song of Solomon, we see an expounding, if you will, of this wonderful love relationship. And in the fifth chapter, the ninth verse, 
we see something that is absolutely incredible. We see that she's standing in front of some people and they ask her a question, which is what I feel the Lord really wants to hit today. Let me just pull this up because I want to see it. Okay. So <laughs> they come and they ask her, what is so special about your bridegroom? The ninth verse of the fifth chapter in Song of Solomon. She's looking for him. They find her, and she's like, I need to find him who I love. And they say, whoa, whoa, wait a second. What's so special about this guy? Do you want to know what she says? This is absolutely incredible. So she begins to describe him, literally wrapped up in him. She says, I got to find it right because it's got to be said right. She says, my beloved is dazzling. What's so special about him? He's dazzling. What does this word dazzling mean? It means completely white or brightness taken to the extreme. He's blindingly magnificent. And if you're wondering what would be the significance of actually saying this, well, it is pointing to the divine effulgence. What is the divine effulgence? It is the radiance of God supreme in a person. Jesus is called the radiance of the divine, the exact representation of his image. He's the bearer of God's light. He is this thing. And she says, what's so special about him? Well, he's blindingly glorious. That's number one. But then she says, she says that he is, he is ruddy. Do you know what this word ruddy means? This word ruddy means that he's red. Do you know what red is symbolic of? Blood. So she's saying, why do I love him? It's because the splendor of his majesty and he drips with blood for me. That's why I love him. She says, why do I love him? What's so special about him? She says, he's brightness taken to the extreme. He's a bleeding dream. And I'm needing him. And in seeing him near, everything else disappears. Do you remember that the, the lamb in Revelation looks as though he has been slain, but he's alive? So in other words, he's alive, but he looks like he's been slain. So in other words, he's bleeding. Christ's bleeding is not finished. He's still dripping blood for you 2,000 years later. He's longing to have all of you. See, she goes on to say, what is so special about my beloved? She goes, he's the chiefest among 10,000. It's so funny. Charles Spurgeon says, there's no such word as chiefest. <laughs> he says, the weight of his perfection breaks down vocabulary and causes men to look, to look for something new, to articulate something they've never known. Oh, he is the cheapest of 10,000. 10,000 what? 10,000 whatever you want. <laughs> if I were to give you 10,000 shepherds, they would all pale in comparison to the good shepherd. If I, fend, if I found 10,000 great warriors, they would all be forgotten in the presence of the captain of the host of the Lord. If I found 10,000 lords, they would all slip to the side next to the Lord of lords. If I found 10,000 of the greatest kings... They would pale in comparison to the king of kings. If I found 10,000 preachers, they'd all be mute at the sight of the living word. If I found 10,000 lovers, not one of them could captivate your heart like the lover of our souls. It is him, and it will always be him. You know what she says next? She goes, his head, his head is gold. She's almost wrapped as she's describing this one that we love. I told you I've come to tell you about his irresistible beauty and the all-sufficiency of his person. She says, what do I love about him? His head is gold. You say, that's really weird, Eric. His head is gold. I don't even understand. That's weird. She's saying something. What is it that she's trying to say? What could this mean? Well, remember the writer of this is Solomon who knew 
the holy place and knew that everything in there was made of gold. So when she says his head is gold, gold points to the heavenly glory of God, the ark of the presence and the overlaying of the mercy seat. Why do I love him? Because the holy place is his holy face. Why do I love him? Because mercy and glory are mixed in one look. Why do I love him? Because he is the exact representation of the glory of God. That's why I love him. But then she says this strange phrase. She goes, but his locks are black as a raven. What does that mean? All of a sudden he's gold and now his hair is black. It's pointing to the fact that he's still a human. That's amazing. This is pointing to the fact that he is perfect divinity, completely humanity and divinity, completing all the things that God is wanting to do in the earth. He's the perfection of them all. Why do I love him? Because he's a person, a taste, a resting place. Why do I love him? Because his eyes are like doves set in blue water and milk settled or fitly set. This is what she says. That's really strange. What is she talking about? The dove in his eyes represents the Holy Spirit. The blue represents the waters of refreshing. The milk, she calls it, is the milk of the precious word. Fitly set has to do with great and deep repose. What is this, Eric? I don't, can you put it all together so I can understand it? See, the dove is how the Spirit came upon, came upon Christ. So she's saying this, his, in his eyes is the fullness of the Spirit. Here's the reason why there's no activity of the Spirit in some people's lives. They don't look in his eyes where the dove is. To look into his eyes is to find the activity of the sevenfold Spirit. To experience in his eyes the Spirit is to find all fruitfulness in one gaze. Tozer said, when the eyes of the soul looking out meet the eyes of God looking in, right there, heaven has begun upon the earth. Cure DR said, prayer is simply this, me looking at him and him looking at me. <laughs> I looked in the lights, now I can't see my notes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> to look away from his eyes is to leave the leading of the spirit. I just can't find what the Spirit is doing. Look in his eyes. You'll see the dove. <laughs> the gentle nourishment of the milk, such is only found in the lover's eyes. The blue water is symbolic of the times of refreshing in the Holy Ghost, fitly set, it's completely settled. None of these, none of these things are not experiential. They're all experiential. Why do I love him? She says his cheeks are fragrant with spices isn't that beautiful what does that mean what's the sim why would she say his cheeks smell good she's trying to say there's fragrance in his face a fragrance that only those who draw face to face with him can experience only intimate proximity can experience this balm are you following me why do I love him? She says, his lips are blood red and fragrant. Not just his words. She says, his lips. Many people have memorized his words. But to hear them from his lips is a whole nother ball game. To hear them proceed out from his mouth, there you have the life source himself passing into you the life that he is in himself. And you're not just taking principles off to the side and saying, I'm going to base my life off principles. No, you're basing your life off his lips. Because you hear him. See, many men, I said, have memorized his words. Many men can describe honey, but only Jesus dispenses honey. And this, is, this comes from his lips. Anyone can read it, but when you see it, when you feel it, when the gentle whisper comes into you, then you live. So to detach his words from his lips is the very condemnation of the Pharisees. They knew what he said, but they didn't know what he was saying. There's a difference. See, it's a wonderful thing to read his promises, but it's an even more glorious thing to hear his promises from his lips. Solomon's father actually said, Solomon's father, David, he said, the law of your mouth is more precious to me than silver and gold. The angels obey the voice of his word. 
The prophet says that he waits to see what the Lord will say. What does that mean? It means he's looking at his lips. This is the only truly prophetic life there is. Prophetic life is not prophetic language. It's staring at his lips. That's what prophecy is. Why do I love him? The Bible says right here in Song of Solomon that his hands are gold. That's incredible. Why? Because the gold represents the glory of God, which means the hands are the doing of the Lord by his own glory. This is what Paul means when he says the strength of his might. In other words, the glory of God is when God does a thing himself. Your hands and my hands will never be gold. Only his hands are gold, which means only his works count. As a matter of fact, she actually says in the same verse that his hands are pierced. The only way to do resurrected works is for them to come from a, a hand with holes in it. I remember a woman came to a pastor one time and she says, oh, she was actually in, 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 in the hospital. She was going to die and the pastor comes to visit her. And you see the scene? She's dying. He comes to see her and he says to her this. He says, if you are to die, will you go be with the Lord? And this old woman says this. She goes, when I get to heaven, I will just show him my hands. How I have read the Bible all these years. I have tended to my family all these years. I have lifted these in the sanctuary. And I have, you know, pushed the plate away. I've done all kinds of things with these hands. He'll understand. And the pastor says, that's beautiful. He goes, but there's only one problem. God only has eyes for hands with holes in them. And then he says, why don't you take your trust out of your own hands and put them in the hands with holes? This is the gospel, friends. You can't make yourself better. You trust in the perfect works of the golden hands, the bridegroom himself performing all things unto himself. Here it is, the secret of an easy life. Eric, you just said easy. Absolutely, because my bridegroom says to me, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If it's heavy, it's not him. Why? Because he told us what characterizes his way, and it's easy. Remember, I remember Bob Gladstone yelled in my face one day, and he said, everything in the spirit is easy. He was two inches from my face, and spit went in my mouth. And <laughs> it was the greatest impartation of my life. <laughs> Why do I love him? Listen to this one. She says, his body is ivory. That's very interesting, isn't it? She loves his body of ivory. What is this pointing to? Well, the writer, remember, of this is Solomon. And the scripture tells us, Chronicles, that his throne was made of ivory. She's talking about the rule of the king. Why do I love him? Because of his rulership, because of his dominion, because of his kingship. Because he rules me beautifully. That's why I love him. Then she says, why do I love him? Because his legs are steady pillars steeped in gold. In other words, he's unshakable and immovable. Set it, settled upon his own glory. Why do I love him? She says, well, his voice is like honey. The sweet experience of tasting the words of God. The taste of all wisdom. Why do I love him, she says. She brings out. A summary statement. Did you know that the old Puritans waited the entire sermon for what was called the summary? If you've ever studied the Puritans' lives, you know what I'm talking about. They waited for what they felt was the climax, was the point, was the driving home all collection of every statement in one statement. The summary is everything to a Puritan. And so it is with this woman who is wrapped in describing her beloved. She takes all of these wonderful, glorious things and she puts them all together and gives you four words to summarize who he is. And her chosen words are, he is altogether lovely. I believe that this is the reason why so many people get lost along the way. They forget how lovely he is. I know this. Every time I see him, I ask him to forgive me for forgetting how beautiful he is. Every time my soul, even this morning, as I put my heart upon him and my soul began to perceive his person, I begin to see how blind I really am apart from him. In that moment, I begin to just feel like I forgot 
how wonderful he is. I didn't even know I had forgotten until he was so near. She summarizes, he is altogether lovely. In other words, everything about him is everything I could ever desire. In other words, he's the fulfillment of all the desires. Charles Spurgeon says that this phrase, altogether lovely, lovely can be translated the fulfillment of all desires. In other words, all you ever wanted and all you will ever want. He is altogether lovely. Herein lies the indictment against the bride or the church of Christ is that she hasn't become the bride by only wanting him. There's a Greek saint, he was visited by Jesus. He was going through many things. I want you to listen closely to this next part, okay? And the Lord appears to him and he stands in front of him and he says these words. He says, my dear son, do you desire good things? There is none good but me. Do you desire blessing? Who's more blessed than me? Do you desire power? Who's more powerful than me? Do you desire spiritual heights? Am I not the pinnacle? Do you desire riches? Well, they're all hidden in me. Do you desire wisdom? Well, someone wiser than Solomon is here. Do you desire friendship? Who's a friend like me? Do you desire help? Who can help you but me? Do you seek joy? I am joy. Do you seek comfort? I am all comfort. Do you seek peace? I'm the prince of peace. Do you seek life? Can another be life to you? Do you seek light? Well, I am the light of the world. Do you desire beauty? Who's more beautiful than me? Complexity comes in when we stop seeing the beauty of Christ. And then we get all these other things we start focusing on and talking about and emphasizing, but we all the while, he's right there, more beautiful than ever, shining like the sun, and our, we turn our faces from him and look at his things. Oh, it's so easy to cheat on God with stuff God gave you. Even the, own, even the graces God has put upon your life, you can put them in his place. But to love him and give him all your attention, this is the, the, the bridal perspective. This is the bridegroom-bride relationship. See, he who looketh not, loveth not. You can tell who loves by who looks. And you can tell who looks by who loves. <laughs> See, God is not trying to take pleasures away from you. He's actually trying to offer you the greatest pleasure himself. For far too long, men have played with sparks when God offers us the sun. I tell you, foolishness has reached its height when men give attention to things far inferior to him in his stead. And this is the daily situation that we all face. Eric, what does this have to do with my daily life? Well, he's a daily bridegroom. I have daily cares. Well, he has a daily carrying. Well, I have, I have all kinds of stuff that, you know, are going, is going on right now in my life. I'm not sure if I'm able to tackle it. Well, he'll actually perform it for you. Andrew Murray once wrote, God longs to live your life for you. Mother Bechelia Schlink said this. She said, you are here. What more could I want? I'm telling you, Whatever you put in that blank as wanting more than him is the root of all, your, all of your problems. All of your issues have one major issue. You haven't let Christ be everything. I know that every one of my failures was first a failure to depend upon him. No matter what it is. See, he longs to be longed for. He seeks to be sought. He desires to be desired See, he longs to be with you, and I, if, if you could actually hear him right now, and this is what I'm hoping you'll hear in this message, is that he is saying, let me see your face. Let me take you away from everybody, and I want to see your face. I remember one time, Leah, my nine-year-old, had called me, and I was on a trip, and I just wanted to look at her. I just wanted to see her. And she was running around with the phone showing me this and showing me that. And I'm looking, I'm getting dizzy, you know, looking at the phone while she's showing all this stuff. And then finally, when she's done with all her stuff, she lays down and puts the phone 
right on her face. And now her face is still on the screen. And I said, oh, there you are. And I feel like the Lord does this with me all the time. He waits for me just to sit down and then just look at him. And then he says, there you are. Let me see your face. I just want to look at you. I don't want anything from you. Just look at me. You'll find everything you need. And then you'll be what you need to be. You don't have to worry. Just love me and you'll find in here is the solution for all things. You don't have to run on a treadmill. You don't have to put yourself through the mill. Just love me and herein you find the highest way. You find soaring with the eagles. You find the life that is above. It's the, the life of first love. See, loving Jesus means that nothing is competing with him for your attention. Loving Jesus means he holds your attention without competition. Loving Jesus is where our hearts bloom and blossom with the fruit of the Spirit. And it becomes so simple. Struggling is replaced with snuggling. And wrestling is replaced with nestling. Ease is in everything. And we accomplish more on accident than we ever did on purpose. You find when you love Jesus, you begin to pray less and sing more. Instead of going through the day, God, please do something to it, you just start, you're just like Cinderella. So this is love. Mm -hmm. So this is love. So this is what makes life divine. I'm all aglow, and now I know the key to all heaven is mine. My heart has wings, and I can fly. I'll touch every star in the sky. So this is the miracle that I've been dreaming of. So this is love. Your mundane chores begin to be concerts unto the king, an audience of one. You do the dishes and you're in the midst of a performance for him. I love you so much, Lord. You begin to wash the dishes with Dawn soap and your tears. <laughs> what touches me, and I'm going to be closing right here, what touches me in Song of Solomon when they lose each other because of her neglect. Did you hear that? when they lose each other by her neglect. She doesn't lay down on him anymore. She's content to do what she wants to do. And then she loses the sense of his presence. You know what he does? The scripture says that he comes looking for her. Listen close. He comes looking for her in the windows. It's not one window. He goes every place he can find you. And he's looking for you in everything in life. He'll start speaking to you through the clock. He'll talk to you through somebody else's voice. A side conversation. He's looking for you everywhere. He'll remind you of things. He'll put a smell past your face that reminds you of him because he's looking for you through the windows to be with him. I remember one time my heart was just all scattered and I was just getting into performance in my life. How many know it's easy just to slip back and start rebuilding the things you once destroyed? Yeah. And this is when I started to get back into performance in my own life and feeling like everything was about how good I can be or he, that my confidence in him was dependent upon how great I am or, and all this. And I started to get real lacking of grace. That's what this does. You lack grace, by the way. When you start getting into your own performance, there's no ease and simplicity anymore. It's like treading. It's like going up a mountain instead of flying. It's the difference between trying to climb Everest and taking a plane over Everest. <laughs> I was walking. I was in the restaurant with my wife. And I just had to get away for a minute. And I said, I'm gonna, I, I need to use the restroom. And I go into the restroom. And as soon as I go into the restroom, I smell an air freshener in the restroom that is the exact fragrance that they used in the Brownsville Revival where I got saved. <laughs> and as soon as I stepped into the bathroom, I found him looking for me. And I fell on my knees in the bathroom, just like this. And I said, oh, I won't forget you. Forgive me for forgetting you. I, I give you my heart again. Marry me, Lord. Marry me again. Marry me again. Take all my affections. Take all my attention. Please forgive me for thinking I'm somebody. I'm something. I deeply am in need of you. And to love you is my highest privilege and my greatest joy, the pursuit of life, the goal of everything, just to have you, Lord. And he just came into that bathroom, and that, that bathroom became filled with the golden head of the Lamb of God. And I found him just, just there like this. I remember Mother Bechalia Schlink wrote, without loving attention throughout the day, first love gets rusty. 
without quality time with him in a day, first love starts getting rusty. Do you know what I mean when I say that? How can you tell if first love is getting rusty? Things start being really difficult. Everything starts getting on your nerves. First love takes you up above things, so their relevance is gone. It doesn't matter what happens to you. So he's waiting for her attention. He's longing to gain her affection. He's reaching out for her heart. And it reminds me of, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man would open that door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. So I'm just gonna say two more statements and we'll close out, okay? I really feel like the Lord's already been doing something in people's lives. Different things will happen and he'll break you open. Just in the midst of thinking of him, he'll just break you open. Oh, break us open, God. Break our hard hearts open to be unto you again. See, God would rather, God, listen closely. God would rather end all of his purposes through you than to lose your heart. This is why he exposes ministers that get in sin. He's like, I did have purposes for you, but to have your heart is more important. So he cuts everything off from them to bring them back to square one. I need to love you. Are you seeing what I'm saying? God will end in a heartbeat all of the things that he has planned for you if he loses your heart. Why? Because he's not getting what he really wants from you. He's not trying to get you to do stuff. He's trying to get your heart. No amount of activity in the king's service will make up for the neglect of the king. It's just him. Everything that doesn't issue out of first love is worthless to him. Do you remember when Jesus says this? Uh, a, a man must love me more than wife? Whoa. Children? What? You kidding me? What is Jesus saying? He's saying, if you don't love me supremely, he says, you're not worthy of me. What, is that, what does that mean? It means love that doesn't put him first is not even significant to him. Until the heart looks at him, he sees nothing from you. How can you know if you have bridal love? This is where I'm ending these four quick points. This is real fast. I'll go through this in three minutes. How can you know if you have first love? And this will be the altar call as well. If you feel like one of these things hits you, there's a wonderful invitation to renew it right now. Really easy, really simple. It's just like this. Oh Lord, I recognize I need you. <laughs> Here's the key to loving Jesus. I say this every morning of my life. I say, oh Lord, help me love you the way you deserve to be loved. I can't love you. And at times I'll say, I don't love you. But I need your help. And you, he will come in and help you love him. You say, Eric, I want to love him. That's the greatest starting point. Then you begin to say, help me love you. So here's how you can tell if you have first love. Number one, nothing and no one captivates your heart like him. Nothing moves you. Nothing is more desired than him. If that's not you, you can get that right now. The Holy Spirit does this. He pours inside of you the love of God. Number two, time with him is above everything else. If that's not your life, it can start today by simply turning your heart, saying, oh, Lord, help me love you the way you deserve to be loved. Number three, his word means more to you than the words of men. If that's not you and you don't have a high value for his voice, then it can start today. You say, Lord, put inside of me this love. And number four, his desires mean more to you than your desires. What he wants for your life is more important than what you want for your life. Meaning he has all control of what you will do. He has all control of where you will go. He has all control of what you will. You give him such mastery for he has mastered me, that kind of thing. The bride in Revelation has made herself ready, the scripture says. How did she make herself ready? She clothed herself with white raiment so that when he comes, she's ready. This is the beauty of a bride. She is already decided there's only one she wants. 
This is the beauty of a bride. She now puts her entire life in a way that is presentable to him. She prepares herself and gets herself ready to be pleasing to him. This is the beauty of a bride. What is white raiment? Did you know that the Hebrew word for white is illuminated by the sun? What are these white raiment? What's this white raiment that's put on you? It is those things that Jesus has illuminated in your life. It has to come forth from the radiant face of Jesus. You guys hearing me? So this is what I'd like to do. If we can close out like this, if the crew can come back up here. Is that all right if we do that? If we, yeah. We're going to bring the crew back up here. I already know the Lord has been talking and knocking on hearts here. Maybe you're like, Eric, I live this way. Well, then you're probably more excited about this than anybody else. And you desire to lay at his feet more than anybody else. But what I'm going to ask you to do is to respond. What do you mean by respond? Whatever you need to do. Maybe you want to just kneel down in your chair. Maybe you want to come up here and lay down. Maybe you want to stand up and lift your hands. But I, I'm asking you to hear the invitation of the bridegroom to marry him and say, yes, Lord, I will marry you by some type of a response. Whatever you want to do as your response to the Lord is between you and God. Okay? Is that all right? Father, I thank you so much. Can you do that song, that, that, that one? He, you know, the one you just ended with? Yep. Yeah. I thank you so much, Lord. You're so beautiful. You are lovely and more precious than gold and silver. You are the only thing worthy, Lord. We worship you. Come, just respond to the Lord some way. Just respond to him. Yes, Lord, I will marry you. I will marry you. Just put your heart down at his feet. Say, I choose your feet again, Lord. I choose your feet again. Forgive me for giving attention to things that are far inferior to you. I give you your rightful place. and sing it out from your heart. You are enough for me. In you is all I need. You are enough for me. In you is all I need. In you is all I need. Come on, sing it out to him from your heart. You are enough for me. In you is all I need. You are enough for me. In you is all. You 
you are 